So welcome all and welcome to the Hyperledger Media and Entertainment Special Interest Group. As noted, this event is being recorded and will be available on the Hyperledger YouTube channel. I am Brett Russell, co-chair of the Hyperledger Media and Entertainment Special Interest Group. And with us today is our fabulous and very helpful chair assistant, Ms. Randy Gibbons. Good morning. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry, um, I'm having technical difficulties with my camera, so you can't see me. Um, but I, hopefully you can hear me okay. We can hear you fine, Randy. Okay. Um, and um, once again, I'd like to say welcome to our Hyperledger Media and Entertainment Special Interest Groups. I will be posting um, the links for our pages as well as our LinkedIn page um, that you can follow along. And hopefully um, you can keep in touch with our community. And once again, we um, really appreciate you taking your time to come on today. Thank you. And thank you, Brett. Thank you, Randy. Randy's gonna be posting the, uh, the antitrust statement and a code of conduct in the, um, in the chat, which is uh, the Hyperledger uh, standard for all our meetings. So thank you very much, Randy, and thank you all for attending. Let's uh, move along here. Um, welcome all to the inaugural meeting of the Hyperledger Blockchain AI Roundtable. I am Brett Russell again, organizer and member of the Hyperledger Blockchain AI Roundtable. And I am pleased to introduce the six other founding members of this roundtable. I'll first introduce you to Karen Hilroy. Great to see you, Karen. Karen is a full stack AI developer and author of several interesting and timely books, most notably Blockchain Tethered AI and IP and the Law. Along with being well entrenched in all things AI, Karen is also CEO of Kilroy Blockchain and led a team that won the 2017 IBM Watson Build. Karen is also our roundtable moderator. I introduce you to Todd Holmes. Welcome, Todd, and it's great to see you again. Todd is Associate Professor of Entertainment Media Management at California State University, Northridge. Todd's faith thing is teaching courses in media management and media and entrepreneurship among many other things. Up next is Ethan Cool. Is Ethan here? I didn't, uh, I didn't see him on the list. Okay. Oh, he's Ethan, on the list. Oh, there he is. Sorry, Ethan. I didn't see you pop no in there. Good morning, Ethan. Uh, I welcome you and uh, good to see you again. Ethan is a senior data scientist with Walmart and brings his expertise in AI to our round table. Up next, Jay Deverett. I welcome Jay. Great to see you again. Jay is manager at Deloitte Consulting, blockchain and digital assets. Along with being totally distracted by the potential of blockchain and digital assets, Jay is a successful film producer with feature films distributed by Netflix, ABC and Disney. I introduce you to Orson Weems. Welcome, Orson. We're excited to have you here. Thank you. Orson. I'm excited as well. Thank you. Orson is executive director of the Music Education Initiative and the nephew of the legendary Al Bell, founder of Stax Records and former president of Motown. An impressive pedigree. Welcome, Andy Rosen. Excellent to have you. Andy is a technical innovator and a troubleshooter and is founder of Sequence Key. Andy is knowledgeable in imaging signal systems design and is recognized for work in content protection standards. That should uh, pretty much uh, cover our, our, our membership, uh, seven of us all together. Uh, there's a wealth of knowledge and experience here today and over the next while, we are going to discuss the challenges AI presents the entertainment industry and as we do, we'll venture down the rabbit hole and explore solutions in the form of private permission blockchain and distributed ledger technologies. Karen will start the conversation with a series of questions relating to how AI is really impacting the entertainment industry. And as all you, you guys are probably, if you're not in front of a computer or a TV, you're, 
you're certainly hearing and feeling all about how the industry is uh, being affected with the recent news, in particular, uh, uh, our, our, uh, our Swifty fans and uh, nothing to do with the uh, football team, but uh, the fake videos going around, et cetera, et cetera. Before I hand this off to, uh, to Karen, uh, the conversation is sure to zigzag between the fake songs, the fake videos, the fake images, the fake news, and all of them posing as real. And here's what I know. AI cannot be trusted, and blockchain can be trusted. And if in the end we can get AI to zig and blockchain to zag, we may find a path to trust in AI. I'll now hand this off to Karen, our moderator. You have the floor, Karen. And thank you all again for coming. Thank you, Brett, and and welcome uh, to everyone, um, our our panel and our guests, uh, to the inaugural meeting of the Hyperledger Blockchain um, AI Roundtable. As Brett said, I'm Karen Kilroy, and I'm moderator of this group, and then I'm also a member of the of the Hyperledger Blockchain AI Roundtable. I'm also uh, an AI uh, a full stack AI developer and author of several books that are published on O'Reilly Media, uh, the two most notable being Blockchain Tethered AI and then uh, AI and the Law. And then in addition to that, uh, I'm also an entrepreneur uh, and I'm CEO of Kilroy Blockchain. I'm really, really happy to uh, introduce the esteemed founding members of this roundtable. Uh, and I'd like to start uh, by speaking with uh, Todd Holmes. Uh, Todd, hello. Hi, Karen. How are you? Hi, I'm doing great. How are you? It's great doing to very, see you. Thank you. Doing very well. Um, Todd is Associate Professor of Entertainment Media Management at California State University, Northridge. So Todd, I have a question for you. Um, AI has been a disruptor in just about every industry imaginable. And as you know very well, the entertainment industry is experiencing its fair share of disruption. Taylor Swift, George Carlin, Drake, The Weeknd, just to name a few, have been front page news lately with AI creations. Todd, what do you feel is the biggest challenge in the entertainment industry with the advancement of generative AI? Okay, that's a, that's a great question, Karen. Uh, well, there there's certainly a lot of concerns about it. I mean, there's certainly a lot of, it provides a lot of opportunities, certainly for entertainment firms, but at the same time, you know, a, a lot of ethical dilemmas and things like that. So um, in terms of challenges, I, I I think, you know, and obviously we looked at, you know, the, the, the length of the strikes and everything last year and how problematic that was. And, and of course, one of the biggest parts of that was AI and exactly how do you, how to utilize it in in a you know positive a positive way, but not negatively impact um, workers within within the industry. So, I think um, yeah, there, there's a lot of things you've got to consider. I think that um, from an ethical standpoint, um, you know, if you're a writer, just making sure that you are getting uh, that basically you're you that you're there's transparency about how you're using AI and how you're not, and making sure that that people aren't, uh, that you can use AI for certain ideas and things like that, but that not allowing it to completely take over um, your writing of, of content, your producing of content. Um, obviously AI can can do a lots of things uh, in terms of other content creation that other, other um, that were not <laughs> available previously. Um, so I think, you know, just trying to figure that out. I think certainly there's an opportunity for certain things such as certainly blockchain technology. Uh, you know, one of the big issues was residuals with the strikes. And I think considering the use of blockchain for the the um, unpaid residuals that are out there, either that's not claimed by by the heirs of, of performers. Um, also just, just essentially the research shows that about 15% of residuals go unpaid. And certainly blockchain has a real positive impact there on being able to, for the payment of of, uh, of that. Um, but obviously, yeah, uh, AI is, like I said, it could be a, a wonderful tool, but at the same time, um, you just want to make sure that, yeah, people, again, their likeness is not being used without their consent, making sure that that's 
that's appropriate in, in the writing process, making sure that writers aren't being completely replaced and that if you're given a script or given content that's been created by AI, making sure that there's transparency and that you're letting people know, hey, this was AI generated and, um, and, and then, you know, just so you know what the situation is. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Todd. And I want to dig a little deeper into that when we come back uh, for our second round of questions. Um, and for right now, I'd like to go to Ethan Keel, um, who is our next uh, Blockchain Roundtable member. Um, Ethan, um, welcome. It's great to see you again. Great to see you, Karen. Um, Ethan is a senior data scientist with Walmart, and he brings his expertise in AI to our roundtable. Ethan also works with me on a nonprofit called Friends of Just Justin, which was formed to help address the disjoint between humans and AI. Ethan, can you tell us a little bit about how AI systems are trained and how this impacts entertainers? Yeah, absolutely. Um... AI systems and how they're developed are rapidly developing right now, and there's new iterations every day. Um, the thing to really know about training AI is that the algorithm is important. It will dictate how the AI or machine learning model learns, but at the end of the day, it only learns the data that it's trained on. And so it is crucially important to have high quality data in these systems. Um, in my experience, what we generally have is three separate teams that are working on building an AI system. We have a data engineering team that is responsible for procuring high quality data, for pipelining it and cleaning it um, for use in the model. And then we have the data science team that is actually working on implementing an algorithm, you know, fine tuning hyperparameters to get the exact learning and uh, just the exact statistical um, algorithm that we want. Uh, and then there's also a machine learning engineering team that is responsible for building a product out of that model, um, whether that means helping ensure that, that model trains faster or generates inference faster. And what we, when we say inference, that is the results that is generated by the model, um, either via prompting it or um, API calls, anything along those lines. Um, and so generally, generally speaking, uh, we have had those teams exist uh, at a large scale like Walmart in the past, um, where you know a, a team like a startup level, they may not have necessarily all these different divisions, um, but I would say the same processes still exist. There's just you know uh, a, a more a less defined role for each each member. Um, and like I said, this is evolving every day right now, especially with LLMs. Um, it's a totally new training paradigm there's a there's a new uh process that that is going on that we call uh fine tuning these llms and that involves using open source algorithms and then tuning them slightly to a specific use case and that is presenting new challenges in and of itself because of the size of these open source models um, it's it's something that is introducing a totally new paradigm in in this process. Um, but as I said, I would break it down into you know cleaning your data, sending it into the model. One team, one team focused on the algorithm itself, making sure that you're generating the machine learning model that you want to generate. You're getting the best learning possible from your data. And then the team that's responsible for productionizing that model and and making it usable for folks. Thank you. Wow, that's a that's a really great uh, explanation of how these AI models are trained, and uh, I'd like to come back and dig into that a little deeper on our next round. Um, my next question uh, is for Jay. Uh, welcome, Jay Deverett. Hi. Hello, um, Jay. Maybe you can uh, clear some of this 
up, uh, you know, our first our first presenter uh, talked about uh, our first guest talked about how there's a lot of challenges in the entertainment industry, and now Ethan's saying, "Well, here's here's how the here's the science behind it." So I'm kind of thinking maybe you can see the middle ground. Uh, Jay has a great perspective as a manager at Deloitte Consulting Blockchain Digital Assets, and in addition to that, he's a successful film producer. So Jay, my question for you, uh, tell us what you feel is the biggest challenge uh, in the entertainment industry with the advancement of generative AI. I mean, you know, there's so many different perspectives you can look at it from. From the perspective of talent, it's just we've reached a point in the industry where it is so hard to break through to actually making a living and staying and actually getting to put your full self into being an artist. and. Generative AI, up to this point, we've seen so many disruptions. I mean, as I'm sure Orson can talk about, we've seen, we saw distributed pirating software to take, you know, really take the music industry for a run ages ago. We've seen problems nowadays with the streaming revolution in just companies like Netflix and Amazon being able to just fully buy out of just kind of corner and monopolize the market and buy out pieces of entertainment and just cut residuals out of the deal. Um, and we're seeing really what happens, the long-term effects of that when, or I mean, we're starting to see the long-term effects of that when you go eight months without having any working union writers or actors. Um, and I think the biggest challenge right now is probably how do you, how do you credit artists and pay them properly and incentivize them in a world where there is so many different ways to create content and to be and to sort of find home and hone your craft and yet so few ways to actually get in the door of the big distributors and so much has to be given up for them to actually get through the door and what i mean by that is just there's no no one is no one is showing up at a Hollywood studio with a script that is really good. You have to be repped by an agency that has a pipeline into the studios. You have to be, you have to basically have in order to even get repped, you have to have made a feature or a short already. There's a sizable financial investment that has to have been has to have been put into your career. It is so hard to actually get to that point. And I think the problem that we're seeing is that. There's just too few opportunities for artists to make a living and to continue to make a living in, in this area. And yet there is such a high demand for entertainment. I mean, it is, it's just, if you look at the common sense, the, I'd say the default activity for at least most people I know when you don't, when you don't have anything to do is to turn on Netflix. And how is it that we have, how is it that we should ever have a shortage of content? And how is it that we should ever have a shortage of talent in this industry? And yet we're seeing both. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, that's a serious uh, dilemma. And uh, hopefully this roundtable will come to some answers on some of those things as we as we progress through our discussions. Thank you, Jay. Um, our next guest uh, is uh, Orson, Orson Weems. Uh, he's our, our next AI blockchain roundtable member. And welcome, Orson. We're really excited to have you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you all for having me as well. I'm excited to be here. Hello to all our guests as well. Now, I met Orson uh, because he was implementing some on-the-ground training to get people to work in the entertainment industry. And he is the executive director of the Music Education Initiative. And he's also the nephew of the legendary Al Bell, who was the founder of Stax Records and former president of Motown. Now, Orson, uh, you are closely involved with many musical artists, your uncle among them. Can you tell me what is the biggest threat to the livelihood of today's musicians and how is this situation being impacted by AI? Well, thank you again. The, the, the thing that one of the things that Jay just said was the, the streaming part of that. But on top of that, now we have the uh, where it's not just sampling anymore. It's just literally just taking the music of the artist, uh, creating what other people think is new music, but 
and the the new person that presents this music is getting the money for it. And the other artist that created the original music doesn't even know it's been taken and used. And that's a threat uh, to not just their livelihood, their 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 generations to come, but of created real music that we didn't have all of these different mechanical and digital uh, items that would help affect the music industry. And I, I got to tell you, the threat of that is the loss of not just this great creativity of music, but the the dependency that people are using instead of creating. We're losing, almost dumbing down a music industry of the different genres of, of music and entertainment. But I, I feel that one of the largest things is, is the, the money that the artists are losing and taking. It's being taken from them. And I, I tell you, I've seen so much. Uh, my, my uncle uh, has uh, the Won't There It Is in his catalog, and that was sampled and redone on so many different levels and so many different people have, have used that. Uh, I've heard just different music uh, from some of the artists that are, were under the Stax label and now the the uh, legacy album through uh, of Stax through Concord Records that now Stax is part of. And I've seen people just take different samples from Otis Redding to Carla Thomas to uh, the 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 barcades, the thing from Shaft, and the, so I think what the biggest threat right now is the misuse of AI on original content that would affect artists and musicians alike, and musicians as well because of this uh, thing that I've come to know about is stem separation, and, and we're talking name, image, likenesses as well as it's big in the athletic world. But name, image, and likeness is also big in the entertainment world, which would be uh, the music entertainment world is all. Thank you, Orson. You're welcome. Thank you. Our next question is for Andy Rosen, our, our uh, esteemed Blockchain AI Roundtable member. I'm so happy you're here, Andy. Thank you for joining us. I'm honored for the invitation. <laughs> it's always great to see you. Uh, Andy is a technical innovator and a troubleshooter and is founder of Sequence Key. Andy is knowledgeable in imaging systems, in imaging signal systems design, and is recognized for work and content protection standards. Andy, what do you feel is the greatest challenge in the entertainment industry with the advancement of generative AI? The greatest challenge was shared to me uh, by the head cryptographer at Microsoft. And that is that uh, uh, Josh Benelaw teaches his students that as long as someone can get in front of a camera and lie, we have a serious problem. And the again, I'm jumping ahead. You're wanting to know what the challenge is? Yeah, what how is this impacting the industry from what you're seeing? What's what's the what's what's going to have to be overcome? What is being overcome is that in the area of ad supported entertainment, which is the growth arena and will continue to be the growth arena for mass entertainment for a few years at least, uh Brand safety, uh, brand integrity is being trashed. And Madison, and frankly, the seeds of Madison Avenue's reaction were planted quite a long time ago as network revenues were being seriously eroded by, you know, Facebook, Meta, now TikTok, X, all these things, irresponsible platforms. So, it's not a question of if or when. Your colleagues in another organization, Karen, are deploying uh, content integrity tools across all of the agencies of publicists, and you can you can pretty easily predict when the other two advertising conglomerates will buddy up to them side by side, because um, they've already leaked it. So um, 
the challenge is how we survive this next year. We now have nobody's declared war exactly, but we now have the responsible platforms and the not so responsible platforms. And at the last SIMP conference, I was handing out little, con little uh, content credentials, uh, adhesive stickers, and sticking them on as many studio badges as I could get. It's time for all of us. Run, do not walk. It is time for all of us to go to Madison Avenue and tell them, thank you. We understand, appreciate, and support what you're doing. Yes, there isn't an infrastructure to do all the details, but don't worry about that. That's our job. We, we, we need, <laughs> I, 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 I've been through this. Uh, we, the, the, it's time for personal show up and, and uh, sh you know, encourage a lot of handshaking. Madison Avenue agencies and networks and auditing firms have on my watch in the past on similar matters, set aside their differences and agreed on a hard one uh, set of compromises for a goal of mutual benefit in the area of watermarking and identification. So yeah, 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 what, old, what is old is new again. Uh, uh, Tony the Tiger and a box of Tide will save us all. We just have to tell them we understand <laughs> this. Uh, I'll drink to that. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Andy. So, uh, and last but not least, uh, in my rounds is is our esteemed host, Brett, Brett Russell. Um, Brett, um, uh, he's our uh, he uh, he is the founder of Accuritas, uh, which develops enterprise blockchain for in the entertainment industry. He's also the co-chair of the Hyperledger Media and Entertainment Special Interest Group, which is this group, and the organizer of this roundtable. Brett, hello. Are you there? Good morning again, Karen. I am here, and I'm ready for you. Okay. So you've been around blockchain since 2014. That's a while. And this founder of Accuratus, which is developing blockchain to augment, augment film, television, and music pr production and dis distribution. Can you tell us what's the biggest challenge that you're seeing in the entertainment industry with the advancement of generative AI? I think the um, um, AI has done a, a generative AI has done a great job of assisting the production in many cases of. Uh, of, uh, of film and television uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the production of, uh, of uh, imaging and uh, things of that nature. But it's, it's threatening to take a lot from the industry. And, and uh, even though there are some legal language being used in some of the contracts today, there's a lot of jobs that are gonna be lost. There's a lot of people that are gonna be threatened by this. There's a lot of, there's a lot of legal costs associated with having to protect the likeness, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the image of, uh, of you as an actor or you as a producer and your product and something that you work very hard at producing. So I think that uh, um, we're in the early days as, uh, as Ethan uh, so uh, efficiently notes, we don't know where we're gonna be tomorrow at this time. We don't know what's new, but there's a lot of money being invested huge amounts of money being invested in the, in the development of uh, um, tools that uh, the entertainment industry can use to use AI. And that uh, I think has, needs guardrails and it needs to have some basic standards that can be applied. And we need to know clearly and quickly when, I, when AI is being used, we need to be able to defend uh, a, a product that uh, that we create, that we put out there, that we spend money on, and we need to make sure that that if it's being used, we know immediately, and that we're there's some type of fair compensation rules built around around AI. So the threat is a monetary one, big time. There's people that aren't going to be able to afford to defend any anything. I mean, there, there are laws on the books right now that uh, that uh, that manage copyright, but people can't pursue copyright infringement. It's too expensive. Lawyers are the winners and, uh, and seldom do, uh, you know, seldom is there a lot of quick success and things like that. And, and people just end up uh, 
uh, failing at uh, defending their, what, what, what's rightfully theirs. So I see it being uh, what the problems are today are going to be very different tomorrow. So that's uh, that. That's the, as Ethan said. This is this thing is moving fast and furious. So we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know whether any of the language put in any of these contracts. And uh, I know that's one of your questions you may have for Todd. And that's uh, whether that's going to protect anybody. Uh, you know, today uh, from yesterday or whatever. But, uh, so I see there's uh, some huge monetary challenges for the small guy. And um, uh, it, you know the 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 creatives are, um, which is the source of all of our fun and laughter, are are going to be the losers here. So that's uh, that's my uh, that's my take on things. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. And Karen, I'm going to take over here because I have a question for you. Okay. My question, Karen, is how difficult, in your view, will it be to create the standards and guardrails needed? And what kind of hoops do you think we're going to have to jump through in order to create these standards? Those are great questions. Um, I would say it's not a case of us starting from the beginning and creating the standards because there's been uh, quite a few groups at work on various pieces of the puzzle for many years. And so it's kind of a convergence of all the different solutions uh, to be able to solve some of the things that we need uh, in order to be able to uh, for instance, create responsible systems that will make sure that everyone is paid. Um, the, uh, the, the, the one example um, would be uh, my own work on my book, Blockchain Tethered AI. This wasn't something I did overnight. Um, this was a process of, of about seven years of research. Uh, and it wasn't just me. Uh, it was me asking questions to engineers who then in turn went and did research projects who then came back and published the results. And then we kind of bounced off of each other. It was a long process. But meanwhile, we're not the only people doing it, right? We also, uh, I also ran into the uh, C2PA and the Content Authenticity Initiative. And that's how I met Andy Rosen. And that's another group that has been working for a very long time on this. They've been working from the standard of, of making sure that content can't be faked uh, and being able to, uh, to, to inspect content to find out its origin. And, uh, and there's many, many uh, companies adopting this. And you can also uh, declare things as do not use this for AI training. And, and uh, one of the companies that just joined in is OpenAI. So it's very, interesting group. Uh, Microsoft is, is a part of that and uh, Adobe, those are the leaders. So it's, it's that is going on. Meanwhile, as I've come to learn from Andy, uh, there are many, 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 many other arms already still spinning and at work. And uh, one of the, one of those uh, would be the um, SIMTI group. Uh, and uh, they have been working for a long time on standards for uh, for for uh, managing the same sort of thing. It's not like any one of these groups has not noticed AI is coming. So I think one of the things that we need to do in order to really um, to to get it all into one nice, smoothly working machine is to connect all these different groups and find out what they've been working on and then give them one single source of truth uh, that they can all uh, subscribe to. Excellent, great answer. I put a link up to the SIMTI uh, org on, uh, and I think that also uh, Andy had mentioned that in his, uh, in his response. So there's a link on the chat to Simpy, and that's a great response, Karen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you have you. the floor. You have the floor. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> but that was a lot. We've, we've gotten a lot of, uh, we, we've really got a broad 
uh, 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 level of expertise here is really exciting. And Todd, I'd like to uh, come back with you again and ask you another question. Sure. Um, great. Um, okay, the Writers Guild and SAG-AFTRA made an important component to their last contract. Does it go far enough? Can you can you tell us about it? And can you tell us if it went far enough to protect the the members uh, from uh, from AI? Right. Uh, no, it's a great question. It's it's one of those things that I would say. My short answer would be I don't think it quite goes far enough. But the thing is, I mean, again, things are evolving so quickly. They can be, it can be a challenge. I, I, I certainly think it's going to be up for debate again when the, that contract expires. Um, but I, I think it was important, though, and again, that's part of what led to su such long, pro prolonged strikes last year, uh, was just making sure they got this right at this particular point in time with how rapidly evolving AI technology is. In terms of, um, yeah, in terms of your of your actors, for, things, for instance, um, with the SAG after, I mean, certainly making sure that, that people are, um, that their likeness, that they're going to be compensated if their likeness is going to be used, if they're if there are imagers um, and all that. And I know that that's been a, a concern for a lot of people. I've even had students that have, you know, been background players and they and they go somewhere and 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 to a production and they say, hey, can we go ahead and scan your your likeness? That's one of the first things we do. And certainly making sure that, okay, um, if you're going to, to scan my likeness, making sure that I'm going to be compensated, um, not only, or that I'm going to understand that this is going to be used for this one particular production that you're going to to uh, audition for, but then also the protections though are making sure that okay, if your likeness is then going to be used in a second, third, and fourth, fifth film or or or, or any type of production, your likeness, you'll make sure that you're going to be informed. At least that's the way it's supposed to supposed to work. So certainly that's that's an improvement, making sure people are, are again appropriately compensated there. Um, for the writers, there are yeah protections in terms of making sure that um, again if if a studio hands over a script that's been or content's been AI generated making sure that the writers understand that again that this AI has played a role here uh, and making sure that again people can't take an initial idea that a writer has come up with a writer room the writers room has developed and then uh, utilize AI with that and without again without them being being notified. Um, and certainly there are, there are protections in there about, you've probably heard about, you know, the writer's room and making sure that, that, you know, that people are being appropriately compensated um, for that and making sure that they are, um, because obviously in a streaming world, right, uh, in terms of, of writers, one of the biggest concerns that they had is certainly the shorter seasons, you know, for, for one, and then also just lower residuals in a streaming world that we'd have in traditional broadcasting cable, those, those uh, you know, the the compensation they receive the residuals again are being a lower much lower amount so um obviously you know the improvements with writer writers rooms i think was important making sure that again people are going to be employed for at least a, a set period of time making sure that um again that they have a little bit more stability and long-term long-term work there um but yeah so in terms of ai like i said i think that i i think the actors and writers ideally would have liked to have probably had a few more um, guardrails put into place, but I think overall they're they're pretty happy with where they are. But I do think certainly it's going to be a major sticking point the next time these negotiations come up. I know next year as well as is IATSE they're doing their negotiations, and this is of course a lot of people that work work on set, you know, camera operators, people like that. So AI is going to be a really important part of those negoti negotiations as well moving forward. Wow, it's a stagehands, the y Yahtzee. Right, uh-huh, yeah. Okay, wow, thank you so much. That's a lot of new information. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs> and, <laughs> amazing. Um, so let's go ahead and go to Ethan. Now, Ethan, um, uh, can you tell us some precautions, mm. Ethan? That that uh, pr that production companies could take to prevent AI from using their proprietary work to train and model AI. Yeah, I think um, the previously mentioned C two PA is is where is where my mind goes first, um, and 
the ability to assert how your work should be used, I think is incredibly powerful, um, especially as you know, we dig into, I think it's 1202B in the copyright infringement, where uh, if you mess with uh, content or a, a CMI, um, a copyright management uh, icon, that you can, you can be sued for that. Um, and I think that's gonna be something that really becomes noticeable as we see more digital watermarking technologies, C2PA manifests, things like that, that are being used at the production level um, because they actually are providing a way for us to track the origin of original material, how it is used, how it was, how the producer claimed it should be used, um, whether that's fair rights, whatever, whatever. Um, and then um, being able to uh, track um, that, that very origin of that, of that material. Um, now where the, the hard part comes in is, you know, with AI, being able to say, this is similar enough to original content to know that this was used as training material. That is something that I think will, you know, continually to be continue to be figured out. But the um, the prevalence of digital watermarking technologies, as well as C two P A manifests, um, I really feel like are going to proliferate and and really, um, I mean, they're already used uh, um, for copyright infringement. But it's, I think they're going to become more aware for people at the you know, social media content creator level are going to become more aware of these technologies and more aware of their power um, and where they belong in that, what I call the AI economy, you know, where they're the data originators for that, that whole system and they need to be compensated for, for that role. Um, but I, I really think that C2PA is, is uh, the most powerful technology um, that we have right now to fight against that and being able to correctly display the manifest and fair rights for each item um, or piece of content that is generated um, is going to be incredibly important. And, and how that information is specifically stored and shared on the internet is going to become incredibly important. Yes, yes, I, I definitely agree with that. And also, too, I'll mention if anyone's got any questions uh, in the, uh, please go ahead and put them in the chat. We'll take a look at those questions uh, and and get to them. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, take a look through those. And thank you for that, Ethan. And in the meantime, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Jay a question. Um, Jay, uh, with your knowledge and, and background in blockchain and digital assets, can you and how do you envision uh, blockchain might play an important role in AI infused entertainment industry? Yeah, I mean, uh, to me, blockchain really its primary function in this realm when we're talking about IP um, and the just the the maintenance of IP rights. Um, I think provenance is sort of the absolute biggest topic is just validating where something is, what the origin of IP is as it's sampled, interpolated, built upon, added to, et cetera. I mean, the C2PA that really ties directly into that. Uh, it's, you know, to me, when I think about AI, the biggest actually risk area that I see, obviously, you know, I, I think there are a lot of things that are correctly identified as risks, but maybe are being overstated as risks in, in sort of context with the other problems that are occurring. Um, you know, it's obviously a very dystopian world where a child can go onto like a chat GPT and undress Taylor Swift. There's no question that we need to be doing something about that. But we, in the case of open AI, I would argue it's maybe gone a bit too far. You can't go right now. If you go in there and type in, show me, draw me a picture of Kanye West holding a duck. You can't do it. We've, the open AI has taken away the ability to use anything that is copyrighted. And I don't think enough people are talking about what an issue it is that there is now a public that is, and that includes creators that has access to a completely gated version of this revolutionary software. And 
a complete other side that are just innovating and functioning with the ungated side of this world. And it really brings a question, begs a question about unilateral centralization versus decentralization. And, you know, when you hear about sort of these Taylor Swift pictures that are going on, this is someone who actually has a knowledge of how to use, uh, you know, has is more tech savvy, has the, is using an open source LLM as opposed to open AI. And where blockchain comes in, I mean, I've, I've obviously just addressed two problems and where block, blockchain can solve one of them and not the other. The one that blockchain can solve is when, when content is being widely used and accessed over the internet and being built upon and added to, blockchain can establish provenance. Um, the IP technically has to be of digital origin. So that's where you see, I saw somebody talk about the chain smokers in the chat. There are when there are certain artists who are dropping their stems online, and in order to download them, there is a, a valid, like a validatable chain every single time those are downloaded. That is definitely something. Um, you know, it's it's not perfect. Like this doesn't do away with the need for lawyers. Every single thing is going to have its own individual sort of set of challenges. But I really think we do need to balance. Blockchain can help with uphold provenance, but we're going to need something on the other side to help sort of balance between how much do we patrol what content these LLMs have access to and how much do we, how much do we sort of allow it to have, how much do we deal with sort of creating good behavior around it? And I, I could go on, I could go on about that forever, but I just, I sort of, my <laughs> takeaway is I do think there's a risk of, I do think there's a risk of just preventing the use of this content in out of the fear that it will be misused. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. And uh, Orson, uh, are you there? Orson? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Sorry, there okay. I am. Okay, yeah, Orson. I'm here. <laughs> um, chain smokers. Jay, Jay mentioned something about the chase, chain smokers. Do you also know about that topic? I, I'm familiar with a little bit about them. That's, I had not heard anything about that at all. So please okay. enlighten us. Well, it, uh, uh, really, uh, as Jay mentioned, I think uh, it was mentioned in the chat, uh, Praveen mentioned that uh, a, a DJ duo, and as you know, DJs like to use a lot of different technologies and shock and awe and glitz and all the different things that can make their shows really uh, grab the crowd and engage the crowd. Uh, but with the question of this DJ duo, uh, a unique kind of situation, and uh, about what they do, I, I wasn't familiar with them using the blockchain technology, but for I had seen the article on them using AI to uh, change, modify some of their voices for, for them. And, and I think uh, from that standard, I would say that if they use and modify their own voices, that is okay for them to do not to modify other voices of other artists for their work uh, to get paid or to do a show and those artists that they use. Uh, so I think it would go back to them uh, using their voices. Uh, the, the blockchain that I see for the artists and the AI use that I see is the, uh, the content credentials part of it where I'm telling artists and I've had meetings this week for artists where I've told them do not release an album uh, before you put content credentials on it. And I said, don't upload it or anything until you put content credentials on it simply because as soon as it gets to uh, a streaming service, et cetera, a lot of the artists do not read the small print, especially a lot of independent artists do not read the small print. They just want to tell their friends, I have a piece of music on Spotify and they don't care what happens with it. And, and I've been an uh, advocate of telling them, that's your art. Why would you do that? So protect it. And now we have mechanisms to protect it. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, application that, that I'm aware of that we know that can do uh, the, the provenance, the authenticity of it, as well as keep that integrity uh, of it. it was I was having breakfast yesterday with an entertainment lawyer out in Nashville. Uh, literally when explained of how we can protect his artists and the content with content credentials and put it in a, uh, have a verifier that can verify that it is 
from this particular artist at what particular time of the day and it's theirs and it can be tracked using AI and tracked with using the blockchain. Uh, his, I mean, he just couldn't really believe it. And so we need to be in the position to help and promote and let people know that there are uh, answers to the bad actors that are causing the, a lot of this disruption. And uh, I think that uh, one, I, I can't remember, Karen, if you mentioned it or if Brett mentioned it in your introduction that you've created so many different things. You and Ethan, the, the file baby application, uh, I think, is for provenance. And another thing that came up recently in a, another seminar was the plagiarism part of, of just not just music, but entertainment, where people are using AI to extract different themes and types uh, in literature and writing, and we've seen the misuse of how AI and I think the big uh, brouhaha of somebody like uh, uh, Stephen King, Arthur Stephen King, uh, was really uh, a proponent to say, you can't just download all my books and have AI create a whole different story based on my ideas and the things of that nature. So we think that plagiarism, uh, the, the content content credentials on, even if it's just a thesis at someone's university. And Dr. Todd, you, you might, somebody might just say, I want to protect my thesis so that some professor doesn't grab it from somewhere else and turns it into a book or something like that. And I've read stories like that. So I think we can use that in the, in the blockchain technology, the proper content credentials can help music, artists, entertainers, and I'm looking forward to sharing it and being in this for, for a long time to help artists that are putting out their original content. And then th that can be protected from now on under, in this digital space, if you will. Thank you, Orson. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, so Andy Rosen, Andy Rosen, uh, I saw you pasted something in the chat. Uh, please remember these buzzwords. Add ID and EIDR. So uh, Tony the Tiger and uh, and Snap Crackle and Pop, right? <laughs> Andy, would you like to explain uh, what you've pasted in? Amen. <clears throat> tools. We got tools. We've had tools <laughs> for some time, and the tools used to work great. It the compliance with mandatory registration of all commercials with ad ID is 100% on broadcast and cable. The reason we didn't have a strike among actors in commercial messages is at least in part due to the fact that those performers have a contract with act through actors equity and all the advertisers that say yes that performance will be registered the problem emerges when you know big nasty social networks think they can have a little advantage in the programmatic ad targeting arena by being opaque and using proprietary identifiers and not letting anybody audit. And yeah, I'll go into this another time, but the history of advertising since the golden age of radio in the United States is marked by self-regulation, completely voluntary, economically mandatory, self-regulation. There shall not be any major ad campaign budgets assigned to anything that can't be transparently and independently and scientifically audited by the Media Rating Council and the proprietary nature of some certain nasty platforms you might name, TikTok, you know, Facebook, Twitter X, and so on. The fact that they're closed systems that block the registered identifiers gives me grief. And it doesn't just give Madison Avenue grief, it's driven them to rapid action. So we're doing the right thing. We're doing the right thing for the right reasons. But if you look at this from a no bucks, no buck Rogers point of view, we're a pressure group. We're a vehicle. 
We're a do this because you have to do that. In the name of corporate citizenship, in the name of economic equity, in the name of humanity, stop stripping the identifiers. Okay, we'll sign them and seal them and put them on an immutable chain so even if you try, you won't succeed. Yeah, that's an implementation detail. We really do need to embrace our brothers on Madison Avenue because... This year, they're the ones who've taken action, at least at one of the three major conglomerates. And I've been in standards meetings on the top floor of the Commerce Building with the networks and the advertisers and the auditing services. And I've seen them set aside their differences and literally all hold hands as long as us the technologists, you know, last time around it was Simpty who was host, but as a bunch of propeller heads, we really, it really is time for us to talk to the usual, traditional, you know, cigar chomping Don Drapers of the world and say, don't worry about it. Yes, yes, we're thrilled with what you're doing. We'll work out all the details. Uh, we've done it before. Don't worry about it. We need to do this. It's time for that socialization. <laughs> you can help us get there, Andy. I don't know anybody else who can. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So Brett Russell, Brett Russell, uh, what do you think of all of this? Uh, uh, you, you've got this knowledge and background in blockchain and media and entertainment. And, uh, this was, uh, your, uh, spark of an idea to put this group together. So hearing everything that you've heard, uh, what do you, how do you envision blockchain playing, uh, in an AI infused entertainment industry? Well, I'm, Brett, Brett. <laughs> I'm I am completely delighted the the input from the from the 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 audience as well as the membership here is is amazing and I'm so pleased. It is a uh, um, um, it is a, uh, a going to be a challenge, and I think that uh, um, it's a, a doable challenge. And uh, Andy has got uh, a lot of really very important components to to add to this, and he's. He's going to make a lot of work for some of us, I think, here. And uh, but but the the input from everybody here has told us, Andy. <laughs> the input from you know this is doable. We we uh, 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 the, the 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 burgeoning technology of blockchain, and be it permissioned or public, the potential to use AI and blockchain to harness the. Uh, um, uh, the the advancement or put a saddle on that horse, so to speak, I think is uh, is completely doable. As I said early on in my pres my early uh, statement that uh, AI cannot be trusted, but blockchain is trust. Now, certainly, you know, garbage in, garbage out, and blockchain. I understand that concept, but as long as we can get the right information in, as long as AI training models can be verified and the information that is used to train AI is is correct, has the right permissions, et cetera, et cetera. I think that uh, uh, we as a group can go a long way of building on something that, uh, that we're starting here today. So thank you for that, Karen, and uh, outstanding job. We're, uh, we're approaching an hour. It's uh, one o'clock uh, in the uh, in Eastern. And uh, noon in your area and uh, 10 a.m. in the East Coast. Still time for bacon and eggs, Todd. So um, the, uh, <laughs> I, I want everyone to know that uh, this is the first of, of what I hope to be many uh, upcoming uh, meetings. And I'd like to, uh, to propose that uh, everyone stay tuned on the LinkedIn chat for... Uh, for an update on this particular meeting, the recording, as well as ideas on the next, but there's just a, a wealth of knowledge here. And I thank each and every one of you for, uh, for participating. It's been fun. It's been enjoyable meeting all of you guys. And um, I hope that uh, it becomes more fun, more productive, 
and uh, let's uh, let's look forward to our next meeting together. So I thank you all, and uh, everyone, stay tuned on uh, LinkedIn. We're going to uh, connect with you all. We'll share the video. Have a good look at it. We'll share what's in the chat here as well from some of the great participants. Thank you all, uh, Michael Velesco, and uh, uh, and um, the other gentleman on here who was very uh, uh, Alexander and uh, Praveen. So let's uh, let's. Um, Pamela Ism let's, let's, too. It's not. We'll Pamela forward, Ism. Shout out to Pamela. Pamela, thank <laughs> you, Pamela. And thank you for all attending. Look forward. Hopefully, you're all on the uh, on the LinkedIn uh, uh, site, and uh, that's where the the uh, the video will be posted. So you have a look there, and as well, we're going to take some notes from this chat, and we'll add it to our next uh, we'll add it to our next meeting. But thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks so much. Thank everyone. you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Bye. Good afternoon. Bye.